Good morning, St. Andrews, fellow fishers of people, as we will hear in the gospel lesson for today. Welcome to any of our guests that are joining us today. We are so grateful that you're here. We hope that you will find this service and this time of prayer and the words that are spoken here and the Bible passages that are read here to be fulfilling, to lift your spirit, and to give you joy and a sense of belonging. We hope that you will feel like you belong here at St. Andrew's with us in this loving community that follows the way of Jesus. We've had an eventful week this week. We've had a joyful week this week. We started with the celebration of the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We had the transition into a new administration for our country. And we have the good news of Jesus this morning. This is a good week, and I hope you're ready to celebrate and to pray. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior Jesus Christ and to proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation, that we and the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. travels to Nineveh and warns the citizens of God's judgment. When they heed the warning and repent, God spares them. The first reading according to Jonah, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 and verse 10. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, 
a free day's walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on a sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The word of the Lord. We will read Psalm 62, verses 6 through 14, beginning and ending with the refrain. For God alone my soul in silence waits. For God alone my soul in silence waits. Truly my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold, so that I shall not be shaken. In God is my safety and my honor. God is my strong rock and my refuge. Put your trust in him always, O people. Pour out your hearts before him, for God is our refuge. Those of high degree are but a fleeting breath. Even those of low estate cannot be trusted. On the scales they are lighter than a breath, all of them together. Put no trust in extortion, in robbery take no empty pride. Though wealth increase, set not your heart upon it. God has spoken once, twice have I heard it, that power belongs to God. Steadfast love is yours, O Lord, for you repay everyone according to his deeds. For God alone my soul in silence waits. Paul is convinced that the end of the age is close at hand and urges disciples to remain free from worldly concerns. Followers of Christ should concentrate on doing God's work. The second reading according to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verses 29 through 31. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it, for the present form of this world is passing away. The Word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to Mark. After John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. I speak to the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I don't know if you noticed, but I certainly did, that for the past few years it seemed like every time I would go on my phone or look on my computer, start up a program, any time that I was anywhere near the news, for a lot of the time, it seemed like all we were getting was bad news. It seemed like everything that came through the news feed had some sort of negative aspect to it. And this week, I felt like when I looked at my news feed again, that it was full of good news. That there were no more references or petty things written about the past administration. There were no more 
children in cages. There were no more border walls being put up. There were no more pipelines being built. There were no more indigenous people's land being taken away. There were no more treaties that were being forsaken, the environment being forsaken. This kind of steady stream of what's next, what's the worst thing that could happen, can it get any worse than this? Can there be bad news after bad news after bad news? That cycle, at least for the moment, at least for this week, seemed to be broken. And everything that showed up in my newsfeed seemed to be good news. Or silly news, and sometimes silly news is good news also. Chief among the silly news, I don't know if you've seen this, uh, I have also participated, is uh, at the inauguration, I don't know if you saw, but Senator Bernie Sanders was there, and there's this meme, it's a, a thing that people do where they they take a they take a picture and they and they adjust it in different ways and make different kinds of jokes with it, and so the way this picture of Bernie Sanders from the inauguration on Wednesday has gone what they say viral in, in sort of meme. So he's kind of sitting there in this chair. Actually, I've put him in front of I've done the meme for St. Andrews and I've put him in a chair sitting in front of St. Andrews. So he's also with us. So you see what this meme is actually. You should see it right now. And so these were going all over the internet. I mean, millions and millions of different, like Bernie being placed in different places. And it's just this silly thing. And as I saw all these silly things and seeing the creativity of the way that people make jokes um, through this meme, I just felt this sense of joy. I felt, felt this sense of lightness. I felt this sense that, okay, all I'm seeing is good news. All I'm seeing is silliness. I'm seeing this kind of weight lifted off of our shoulders. And I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for the good news. I'm grateful for the evangelia, as they say in Greek, which is where we get our word evangelism from. It means good news. And that's what Jesus is talking about today. Jesus is talking about the good news. Getting these fishermen so that they can go out and spread the good news. They've, they've come from John's ministry, and John passed sort of this ministry onto Jesus in the baptism, saying, the one who is greater than I is coming after me. And now Jesus is taking up that mantle and spreading the good news beyond Galilee to all of the Holy Land, and eventually through Paul and the other apostles and bishops that will come up to the whole world, to us today. And so we also receive this good news because of these fishermen. These fishermen who decided to follow Jesus and follow the good news. And as I was thinking about good news and I was kind of being joyful about everything that's happened this week, the fact that there was no more violence, first of all, uh, and the fact that we have this new, as I said last week, this new transition, this new era being ushered in into our country, it really feels like it. It actually at least for the first four or five days, it really feels like a new era is being ushered in. Uh, an era where we don't just get a continual barrage of bad news. But as I was thinking about this, and as I was talking to my wife Melanie this week, we started talking about how our good news, this thing that's good for us, is not actually being greeted as good news by everybody. So, in some sense, our good news can also be bad news for somebody else. And we were thinking about that on a theological, a theological side. What is it like when the bad news is, when the good news for us might be bad news for somebody else? And actually, our readings kind of speak to this point, I think. Or at least we can glean something from our readings about when good news for one person 
kind of feels like bad news for somebody else. And I think that's certainly true in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus' ministry starts out, but it, and it starts out with this fishers of men. It starts out with the miracle at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. It starts out with all of this promise, this teacher who nobody can believe how wise he is. But it ends in Jerusalem. It ends on Calvary. And so that good news must not have been good news to everybody. It must have been bad news to some people. Our reading from Jonah is like this as well. Although we only get a small snippet of the Jonah story, of course, everybody remembers that Jonah was swallowed by the whale. We learned that in Sunday school from a very young age. Jonah was swallowed by the whale because when God first spoke to Jonah, Jonah said no. Jonah said, this thing that you want me to do, you want me to go to the capital of the Assyrian Empire, Nineveh, and you want me to tell them that they need to repent to you, a God that they don't follow, and that if they repent, they won't be destroyed. And rather than do that, Jonah runs away. And in running away, he finds out that he cannot escape God. And that's what this being swallowed by the whale is, is that no matter where you go, Jonah, you cannot escape God. Because God is not just the God of a place, God is the God of the universe. And so finally, after Jonah sits in the whale's belly, Jonah decides, maybe I'll go to Nineveh after all. And so that's where we get our reading for today from the Hebrew Testament. Jonah's gone to Nineveh and said, 40 days more and God is going to destroy Nineveh unless you repent. And what did the people do? They repented. They put themselves in sackcloth and ashes and they repented and God changed God's mind about the calamity that would happen to Nineveh. Now the next part of the story, that's good news I think. I think it's good news that God decided not to destroy a city. The next part of the story though shows us that this good news for the people of Nineveh is not good news for Jonah. Because when God changes God's mind about what's going to happen to Nineveh, Jonah says, well, I don't even know why I did this in the first place, if you were just going to spare them. And then Jonah goes and sulks and sits under a tree and asks God to kill him. This good news, this change of an era in Nineveh, this good news was actually bad news for Jonah until God made it so that Jonah could get over this feeling. And so we see that good news can feel like bad news to certain people. For a lot of people today in our country, our good news is not good news for them. It's bad news for them. This, this line in 1 Corinthians, the present world, the present form of the world is passing away, doesn't feel like good news to some people. And I know I hear a lot of people saying, well, we shouldn't care, they didn't care about us, we shouldn't care that they're mad now or they're sulking or anything like but God does not abandon people. God doesn't abandon, God didn't abandon Jonah. God does not abandon people and we shouldn't either. But we should realize and recognize that for people, as the Psalm says, who trust in extortion, people who rob and take empty pride in robbery, people who put their heart on wealth increasing. The good news of the gospel can be bad news to those people sometimes because they're worried about earthly material things, right? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And the good news that Jesus is spreading, that everybody is welcome at the welcome table, that everybody can be healed, that we should love our neighbor as ourself, that we should walk in the way of love, that we should love in a sacrificial love. 
that we should not just love those who love us, that we should love our enemies? That should we not store up things for ourselves but on earth, but store up things for ourselves in heaven? For a lot of people, that is not good news. For the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and Herod, this was not good news. The, the fact that there was this new king of the Jews, this new world order, that heaven was the thing that we should be putting our eyes on and not the earth. The principalities and powers of this world do not want to hear the good news of the gospel. The people who make wealth off the backs of others do not want to hear the good news of the gospel. The people who don't treat their neighbors the way they ought, the people who hate. The good news of the gospel is not always good news for them. Is it good news for us? Is it good news that we should treat our neighbor as we would like to be treated? Even if that neighbor has appeared to be deplorable to us in these past years? Are we, are we going to look at the good news of the gospel and say, well, that's a little bit of bad news. I have to be nice to those people. I have to care about them a little bit. For a lot of people, that's bad news. But for us, for us, it's the way of love. For us, it's the only way that actual unity can happen in this country, the only way that we can come back together. One of the most prevalent problems that we have in this country that has gotten us to the place where we are today is that some people read bad news. Some people are not exposed to good news. And not just on the television channels, that's true too. But we are called to be fishers of people. We are called to be advocates for the good news. We are called to be evangelists. In some ways, the word evangelism means to be a fisher. You need to go out and fish for people and spread the good news. We have too many people getting news from all over the place, making up whatever news they want or reading whatever news they want. And I'm not saying that it just has to be Christian news that is, that is good news to people. We wanna support our Muslim and Jewish and Hindu and Buddhist and all the beautiful diversity of the religious cultures in our nation. But as Christian people, we want to say, we have good news. We have a way of life, like some of our other religious brothers and sisters, that will lead to unity rather than division. It can. It doesn't have to divide us. We want you to come and hear the good news and hear that actually life can be great. And living for others, living for the neighbor, providing for people, not worrying about material possessions all day long and worrying and worrying and worrying. That's not a way to live a life. The way to live a life is to come together with different kinds of groups of people where love can be shared, where you can feel like you're being embraced and feel like you can embrace, embrace other people. Too many people in this world are living in silos of loneliness and despair and bad news. We need to go out and invite people to church. We need to invite people to the good news. And we need to make sure that when we invite people to come and visit us, that where we are, that what we are expressing, that our whole being is devoted to Christ, is devoted to love, and that we are actually giving people the opportunity to come in and feel welcome. And I know that that's the kind of community that St. Andrew's is. 
but I also know that there are intentional ways that we can do that, and we'll work on that. I know this is a, a strange time for a message like this in the middle of a pandemic, but actually it might be the easiest time to evangelize to people in the middle of a pandemic because they don't even have to walk through the doors of a church. You could share this link with somebody. You could share this good news, this short time of prayer and peace with somebody, this short time of love walking the way of love with one another, where we say to each other, we don't have to sit and listen to the bad news. Good news is coming. Good news. The chariot's coming. Good news. I don't want it to leave me behind. I don't want it to leave me behind. I want to be a part of it. And I know that when others are a part of it also, that they're going to feel the love and that that's how we bring unity back to this country. We have to continue to be evangelists, even in a time of pandemic. And then when we are on that blessed day able to get back together, we need to invite people into the church, not just because we need people to come and help us maintain the building or to help us with this ministry or that ministry or because we need to maintain what we do, but because we're actually a place where people can come and learn and grow and feel love and give love. That's what evangelism is about. That's what the good news is about. It's about spreading joy. It's about spreading happiness and joy. This is our call this week. Our call is to be harbingers of good news, not harbingers of bad news. And we have to realize that for some right now, the good news that's happening all around is not good news to them. But if we can love them, if we can love our neighbors, if we can invite them to see, just come and see, maybe they would immediately put down what they were doing before and follow Jesus. Maybe we will put down what we were doing and follow Jesus and become fishers of people. Amen. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for this community, the nation, and the world, for the just and proper use of your creation, for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For Michael, our presiding bishop, for our bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. We pray for all who have died. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We pray for comfort, healing, and strength for Harry Turnage, Christopher Garrison, Andrew Surratt, Taint and Ann Greenwald, Jeannie Hayes, George and Rosetta Hull, Susan Gordon, Gail Davis, Gail Jackson, Vicki Washington, Gail Jolivet, Susan Shackelford, Joseph Meyer, The Adams Family, Bishop Thomas Bridenthal, Alan Harris, Donna Rogers, Elliot Dill, Carol Whitehead, Linda Tucson, Charlotte and Robert Wilson, and healthcare professionals and all St. Andrew's members who need healing. 
We pray for those in retirement communities, nursing homes, and medical care facilities, especially Corinne Blanton, Eleanor Bonner, Jeannie Hayes, and Marjorie Parham. We pray for January birthdays, Nancy Kincaid, Tyrone Yates, and Michael James Doris. We pray for those in the military, law enforcement agencies, and fire departments and EMT specialists, and for all first-line workers during the pandemic and their families, especially Tyrone Hall Jr., Darren Hall, Ernest R.J. Harris, James A.S. Harris, and Brian Hurd. We also pray for the forgiveness of our sins. Let us confess our sins to God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. And now, as is our custom, if you need, please call somebody to make peace with them and offer them the peace of the Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Accept, O Lord, our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the splendor of the whole creation, for the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life, and for the mystery of love. We thank you for the blessing of family and friends and for the loving care which surrounds us on every side. We thank you for setting us at tasks which demand our best efforts and for leading us to accomplishments which satisfy and delight us. We thank you also for the disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. Above all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the truth of his word and the example of his life, for his steadfast obedience by which he overcame temptation, for his dying through which he overcame death, and for his rising to life again, in which we are raised to the life of your kingdom. Grant us the gift of your Spirit, that we may know him and make him known, and through him, at all times and in all places, may give thanks to you in all things. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.